I wanted to ask you some questions about, so, so I, I'm in contact with constantly in contact with people in other countries who want to come to Ukraine. And to be honest with you, um, a lot of them are just talk, you know, words are wind. They're just bullshitting. Um, But the thing is, 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 I mean, you've probably done this too. You've probably wasted out countless hours with people who um, say, oh, how do I come to Ukraine? What do I need to do? What do I, you know, and yeah, then, I've had those questions so many times. Right, right. And it's the same stuff over and over and over. And then they never, they never come, <laughs> Yeah, they, you know, um, and they just basically wasted your time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've had a bunch of them come and do fuck all. <laughs> oh, they did actually come, though. Yeah. Shocking. I was like, at one point, I was like the fucking volunteer coordinator Yeah. for people coming in. They would all message me and ask me to do stuff. Yeah. And and really, like, there's always stuff to do. It's not very glamorous. Uh, a lot of people just come and tell me, I want to go to the front line. I'm like, what kind of experience do you have? Are you sure like you're ready to get shot at? And like are you sure you're ready to almost get bombed or potentially yeah. get bombed? Like and then that that usually wakes them up a bit. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean everyone's first reaction when you're under artillery is I'm in the wrong place. Get me out of here. Yeah, that's so, the dangerous part. When when you start getting, like, they start getting in on you with artillery, a lot of people panic and they'll just run, and that's how you get killed and other people killed. I had I had six friends die that way last year, last fall. Sorry to hear, brother. Yeah, it was it was their first out. And, you know, I, I trained with them and stuff, and I I wasn't there. I just um. But it was their first time out, and they freaking panicked and scattered, and yeah, it was, it was yeah. bad. It was bad. That's when you need you need somebody with like somebody in like gore or intelligence that can help you because we get when we're when we're doing frontline stuff, we get constant intel from from people on the ground. And if our intel says, no, it's not a go, then we just don't go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how I've been able to avoid getting blown up many times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did did I read correctly on Facebook that you, you took a bullet to the head? Or was yes. it shrapnel? Okay. Bullet to the head. Wow. Friendly you... fire incident in Donetsk. Oh. Oh, my God. Yeah. Holy crap, Pretty, man! It's a bummer. Yeah, Almost just died. somebody, somebody flagging you or misidentification. We're doing we're doing trench clearing exercises. Oh, okay. And a guy that was pretty green just didn't have trigger discipline and popped me uh, in the back of the head. Well, it went through the back of my head, bounced around on my brain a bit, and then came out my temple. You're it's amazing you're alive. Yeah, for sure. I was paralyzed for like ten days. Yeah. Uh and the last thing that came back was my left arm. And I couldn't I couldn't move it for like weeks. I can say that, you know, when I was in, in training, uh we had a, a situation that almost almost happened like that. Like literally a bullet whizzed past um the, com- the training commanders ear i mean it was and it was from you know one of the guys in the trenches and um yeah yeah it, friendly it, fire is unfortunately a, a pretty big deal out there yeah uh, because a lot of the training is just not sufficient right they'll put you in like a 30-day boot camp and then ship you to the war yeah and i mean at at the same time you know live live fire exercise is a really important thing to have but yeah um i think they do it a little bit too quickly you know out of necessity 
Thank you, you know I mean? Dimitri. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of value in it. You just have to be fucking careful. Yeah. It's very high risk. What would you change most to what you have seen? Uh, I think there needs to be like sort of a oversight committee or... I think with so many like mix, mismatched volunteers, it would mm -hmm. be good to have like a central hub where volunteers could could jump in, uh, describe what their skill sets are yeah. to an uh, uh, organization that has other connections with other volunteer organizations. And then based on that sort of vetting process, you could get plugged into get plugged into a place where you're most effective because there's a lot of just like winging it going on right some people have negative experiences because they show up and they want to have like they want to go do frontline operations and then they don't get to and then they leave like disappointed because they yeah. waste the vacation days on it yeah like that's just the reality of it like you're not gonna have like a action movie every time you come here yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Everybody's winging it. That's a big part of the problem, you know. And there, uh, it's it's funny that it's been two years, and there, um, I know that there have been some organizations that have tried to set up like a volunteer program, but I, you know, I contacted them myself, and uh, you know, never heard back, and didn't, you know, they. They get overwhelmed very quickly and yeah. easily. But an intelligent, motivated individual can make a difference in 10 days doing unglamorous things like serving food at kitchens, etc. Right. That's that's yeah. kind of the point you were making. Right? My problem is, is I love action. I don't want to just sit around like making IFAX or something. Mm -hmm. Like I'm also a documentarian. So I want to be boost everything. When I first got there, I showed up, I, I took out a loan and I bought like $10,000 worth of, of tourniquets because those are in super high demand. There still yeah. are. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but uh, so my process was cut out any middleman bullshit. Uh, you want tourniquets, what's the unit, what's it for? And I would only do in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. I don't want anything to fall between the cracks into anyone else's hands. I want to deliver those tourniquets directly into the hands of soldiers that need them. So I would never, I would never just, because there's plenty of people that are like, hey, just give me 100 tourniquets and I'll give them to units. I'm like, no, I'll, I'll give it to the units. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I know nothing got, because there's, there's always been a lot of cases of that, you know, like International Legion where people's kit gets stolen. Yeah, absolutely. It's so really true. I, I avoid that at all costs. Yeah. Um, a cipher just said, uh, what commander is going to send a dude for two weeks to the front? <laughs> It'd be just moronic if they did. Yeah. You know. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I will say that my experience in, in, in the Legion was that be, because of this, the past history of the Legion of people you know like you said losing their kits stuff getting stolen yada yada um my experience in the barracks was everybody was really really careful to make sure that they ever you know any rumors of this guy stealing this or this guy is not you know uh trustworthy right i mean we're just uh, it, w it was to be avoided and almost to the point where i i feel like maybe some people who were trustworthy maybe maybe they got pushed out because because rumors started swirling around but i mean i don't know i you know who can say right you know yeah that's tough uh it's kind of a pain in the ass to have to like look over your shoulder everywhere you go and make sure your stuff's there but yeah that's the reality of things yeah when people just don't have supplies and they they see something nice and shiny and they want it for themselves yeah especially when you don't have a a group with with esprit de corps 
you know, with, with a group that has a, a group of guys that's just, you know, random people from all over the place, you know, and that's yeah. obviously a legion that's a big problem, you know. Yeah, that's a big issue in the legion. Last I heard. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of horror stories over there. Yeah. But I really think I I know um I I know some of the new trainers and they they've they are trying to change things. I don't know how successfully. I just I mean, I'll be honest, uh one of the reasons why I started doing this was you know, I thought to myself, wow, when I go back to the legion, I don't want to go back with nothing. I want to have like not not just support for me, but like support for my unit, you know, because yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna get that. And and um, so you know, I I can't. I tried to join a lot of other volunteer groups, and all of them were like, "Yeah, we we've got. We don't need any more people. We're overwhelmed as it is." You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so, I've heard a lot of stuff about like the Legion in general moves pretty slow. Like they're yeah. not super active. I mean, just have low expectations is is what I tell people. <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, Cipher says I would love to go there and train people on weapons, tactics, and such, but can't afford to, and my Marine son wouldn't be happy <laughs> with me for it. Yeah, I mean, they do need trainers. Yeah, for train, sure. trainers are in, always in high demand. Like yeah. a good tra- always in short supply. Good trainer, good trainer, good interpreter com- combination is super needed. Yeah, yeah. By the way, everybody who has who got a membership, um, remember you can you can join our Discord. We have a Discord. It's it's called uh, Why Ukraine: The Last Alliance, and the only way you can join it right now is and actually matt i probably need to i don't know if you do discord or not but i probably need to invite you um, I, I tried it before but I, yeah. I think i missed missed the point of it yeah yeah um i was originally i wanted to set up this uh, a community on like facebook and i because that's what i was familiar with and i started with that yep. but um discord enables you to do so much more and have more security that's the real issue you know yeah i'm open to that if you show me the ropes yeah 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 we'll we'll get into it you know and so i just want to uh put that out to everybody much appreciated so so my question yeah this is really cool stuff uh so my question uh to you matt i guess is um You know, what advice would you have for people who maybe they're coming to join the Legion? Maybe they're coming to join some other some other outfit. Okay. Um, Obvious, and they want to come here for more than two weeks. All right. Uh, You know, what advice would you give to somebody who's, you know, making those plans? Try to think long term. What, what, should, what should they bring with like, them? Think of like think of like how long you're you want to stay and try and have your finances locked down for the duration of your stay. Don't be like me and sell all your shit. Because I sold my car while <laughs> I was there. I sold the camera. I sold most things of value that I still had left. Wow. Uh, just to sustain me for a longer yeah. period of time. Yeah. Or then you have like, if you have an org, you can raise money to, and you can just be transparent about it. Like I need funding to sustain my efforts in Ukraine. Uh, yeah. Which is a bad thing. We try to try to be stingy with your money and not blow donor money left and right. But if you need to like, just be transparent about it. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. uh, dealing with financial stress on top of being in a war zone sucks. It's terrible. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I lock, made... lock your finances in. Mm-hmm. Keep your expectations low if you're new, because and just pr- network as much as you can. Try yeah. and it's ideal that you have some skills that you can offer. 
because anybody can pack lunches for the soldiers. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, I'm much more skill-based. Right. Like I'd rather use my skills to help than, than just do like grunt work. Yeah, I mean, like me, if they tell me to dig a hole, I'll I'll dig a hole. That's fine. I'll I'll dig a trench. I don't mind. They say that's the most important tool in the entire war is a spade. Yeah, because that's how they dig trenches, and trenches are a huge element of this whole war. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I had a guy contact me uh last week maybe. And he, he seemed pretty serious, uh, but he's he's a math professor. Okay. Interesting. But but he's also um, a rock climber, you know, and has all these like wilderness survival skills. So no no military skills, but like a bunch of like wilderness survival skills. And he was like, I really want to come and help Ukraine. I'm ending, you know, he's a math professor, he's ending his his tenure as a so he's he's leaving the university and he's like i want to come wow, to it's a big deal it's a big yeah. commitment yeah yeah exactly i wouldn't give up tenure to come to ukraine <laughs> well uh, i don't think i i doubt that he actually had tenure um from what he from what he told me i think it was more like um you know he's a a lot of college professors unfortunately sadly make very little money and they're basically like yeah. temp temp workers which is a terrible thing about america but yeah. um but you know once i i saw his resume and kind of took a look at everything he was capable of doing i was like okay my advice to you is you know he had he had some first aid like wilderness survival training nice. um stuff that's like useful. that yeah and i said you know that's the kind of thing that well in those situations i've done a bunch of that already where i get some medics uh civilians need that stuff too because yeah. they're getting bombed all the time yeah so like doing like bls uh, for civilians is super useful you just got to find a group uh, B- bls basic life saving ah okay sure yeah, that's a guy. I, I, had, I advised him. I said, I think you would be a good fit for the Legion um, because with that, with that kind of training, Andy's physically fit, like athletic dude. I'm like, and smart. You know, he's a smart guy. Um, he, you know, the Legion needs smart people. <laughs> that's what. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I know that there's all kinds of problems with it, but it, it's it's the devil we know. It's it's what we got, you know. And and yeah. the other thing I would say, um, just in my experience, for better or for worse, uh, the Legion training is kind of a it's kind of like the NFL draft. In other words, you you show up there. Or it's like like spring or yeah, spring training or something. You show up there and. You might end up in the Legion, but about half the guys actually got picked out of the training and went directly to some army, like in the some, you know, 79th blah, blah, blah of the something actually in the Zesehu, you know, directly. Yeah. So for for better or for worse, you know. Oh, Benjamin Webb. Oh, thanks. Thanks for coming, Benjamin. Um, is there anything I can do as a poor disabled foreigner? Uh, I want to help, but without resources, am I just good hearted? Uh, yeah, Benjamin, I, <laughs> friend of mine from uh, New Mexico, by the way. We have a couple of uh, Arizonans in here who know New Mexico well, Benjamin. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I'm glad to see somebody from Facebook posting because it tells me that Facebook is actually working. A lot of times I, when I stream on Facebook, there's some kind of error and people can't post or whatever. But that's fantastic. So... Um, yeah, I mean, my my opinion on that, Benjamin, is what we need to start doing is um, making friends and social groups who uh, of of people who care about Ukraine, getting together and just talking about it. You know, online is great too. Um, you know, if um, sharing sharing videos and liking 
on Facebook and, and Instagram or whatever you can is also good. Um, but you know, what, what in, in my perfect world, what I want to do somehow magically from my, from my home in Ukraine is to make, is to create social groups in America where people can get together and just talk about Ukraine and just, yeah. You know, just just for fun, not like not like you have to donate anything. Just get together and have you know have a spaghetti freaking potluck or something. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean that's the kind of thing that's gonna really make a difference because what makes people give a shit is who they know. You know, and when people say, "Well, I don't know anybody from Ukraine. What's you What's Ukraine done for me lately?" That's um, that's that's where we're going to make a difference. You know, I'm not sure how to make that happen yet, but it's going to happen somehow. That's kind of what I was saying in like my perfect world. There becomes a body, uh, whether it's created by the government or just by like peer to peer. Yeah. You're an entity that specializes in redirecting and, and getting volunteers into things to do. Yeah. yeah. Have them large network of NGOs out there that has like a personal relationship with them and you can have so like somebody Adam joins he has he has first aid knowledge yeah what can we do with him P plug him in with the unit t uh, training first aid like that's like my ideal scenario because there's lots of people that want that are itching to do good things but they just maybe don't have the right network, the, the right exactly. connections. Isolation is the problem. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Benjamin just said, uh, I try and share your posts, but feel very impotent. Yeah. And, and Facebook is, you know, the, the term is in shitification. Uh, <laughs> Facebook is in all of these online uh, apps. They don't bring us together in many ways. They isolate us. And they're trying to yeah. they're trying to get us to the point where we will pay money just to talk to each other. You know, that's ultimately their goal. Yeah. You know? <laughs> What's another thing that's very interesting is if I'm not saying that you should necessarily come to Ukraine if you're disabled, but I know people who live here who came to Ukraine. They're from America. They have they live on disability um, and they're, you know, moderate medium retirement and um, and they live like kings in Ukraine yeah. on on their, you know, however you know, a thousand dollars a month or however much they get for disability here. I mean, my, my wife's family, their retirement, they, they're two retired people and they both together. Uh, I think they together get like less than $400 a month between them, like maybe $300 a month for two people, you know, and, and they have this really nice house here. I mean, for a thousand dollars a month, you could you can at least maybe not in Kiev, okay, but in the village you could live. Yeah, well you can get outside like in the burbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. The further outside of like central Kiev you go, the cheaper everything is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, you know, I mean, I want to go back to Kiev, but I have a, a big house and it's rent free. It's tough to it's tough to turn that down, you know. Yeah. Right. Uh, so cheap and and Conti, I saw that you um, you you have you're you're disabled in in your in Kiev. You know, I mean, um, at the same time, this is a big reason why I I refuse to go back to the United States right now because I feel like if I do, I'm gonna get. It's so easy get, to get caught up in our daily life of everything that's going on, and pretty soon. You just forget about it, you know, right. and that sucks too. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, uh, that happens to a lot of the, like, long-term volunteers. Mm -hmm. You get caught up in, like, the day-to-day -day bullshit or trying to catch up on in your life. And mm -hmm. you lose mm -hmm. the motivation. So, Matt, um, Ronnie was just mentioning talking about uh, making a making a page like a page of, with just information about you know if you want to go to Ukraine um, 
and help. Here's what to do. Here's what not to do. Um, that's one thing I want to do on the Discord is kind of create a repository, a library of information for people who want to do that, um, of just advice of like things that, that Matt just said, you know, make sure you have your finances squared away at least a little bit. Um, I advise people, make sure you have at least a thousand dollars cash. I mean, actual cash. And, um, you know, I think you could, you know, it. I think a thousand dollars will be okay for a month. You know, of course, I I know a guy, a friend of mine, who's he's a trainer in the Legion now, but um, he he got a thousand dollar bonus uh, to come to Ukraine. Okay, maybe I shouldn't be sharing this. No, I will anyway. Um, he first weekend he went to Lviv, got really drunk, and blew it all on strippers. <laughs> That's easy to do. Uh, be, and it is easy because. Um, <laughs> If you, if you um, don't, the thing is, if you don't understand how much money you're spending because of the, the exchange rate, and then um, when you, when you do, let's see, you can in a lot of like bars or restaurants sometimes, especially if they're late night places that are, have a lot of foreigners coming in, they will uh, exchange your dollar bills for grievance you have to pay in grievance yeah strippers need money too that's correct yeah um i i have respect for that profession i've run into a few people like that that just hang out by atms uh -huh. and exchange money like a guy just pulled out like a wad of like i don't know a hundred thousand grievance one time yeah and i was like how much you got and i just traded him and he it was perfect there was no exchange fee Oh, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. But I've also had the experience in a bar where um, they they only accepted grievnas, and I think they did that on purpose. You know, they only accepted grievnas. They didn't accept a uh, card. It was only cash, mm -hmm. and all I had was a uh, hundred dollar, hundred dollars American, and. They, they, I got a, ter I, it was a terrible exchange rate, you know, it was like one to 10 instead of one to 30 or 36 or whatever it is now, you know, so, um, you know, be careful. <laughs> uh, yeah, strippers are, it depends what strip club you go to. Yeah, I just want to, uh, bring up. Secular Sakai, uh, about opening a Ukrainian bank account, man. Uh, Conti, I want information about that too. I gotta say, I that's been some of the biggest problem that I've had, uh, is being unable to open up a, a proper um Ukrainian bank account. Um, I have two Ukrainian bank accounts, but I'm not allowed to actually use them or deposit money in them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a problem. Um, yeah, Dimitri, let's see. So, so far the most stable, reliable program is to, is, is platform rather is telegram. Yeah. Um, yeah, for a lot it, here in Ukraine, it's, it's ironic that this, you know, Russian made, uh, setup has, has been so vital, I would say even here. In Ukraine, you know, like absolutely. Um, I mean, I wouldn't survive in Ukraine without <laughs> without Telegram. Secular Sakai just asked, uh, "Will someone some will some Ukrainian get pissed if they hear one say Grivnias instead of Hrivnias? No, no, <laughs> no. But I have had the experience of where I was trying to say it with my American accent, and they had no idea what I was talking about. Like I'm like Skilki Costa, Grivnias, Grivnias, Grivnias. I was trying to say it every way I could, and they were like, "What?" Yeah. So people in Ukraine are not. It depends on where you go, but oftentimes they may not be accustomed to accents like as americans if you grew yeah. up in 
California or New York or Chicago or any major city, you're used to kind of different kinds of accents and things. Um, outside of Kiev and even even inside of Kiev, people don't understand accents <laughs> at all. Yeah, I mean, in general, the English literacy in Ukraine is pretty low. Yes. I mean, I've, I've been lucky to find some good bars and places that I frequented a lot. Uh, and they all spoke English. Yeah, in Kiev. They exist, but it's just not... Like, the younger people seem to speak more English than the older people. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> if you can learn, you know, Olden Pivo Budlaska, right? Yeah. That, that's that's good enough. That's that's one beer, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that'll that'll get you a long ways. And uh, Skilki Costa is how much how much does it cost? And then they'll tell you, but you won't understand it because it's still in Ukrainian. But sometimes they have to write it down for me. Um, yeah, uh, but to be honest with you, I I have met a couple of retirees who've lived here for five, six almost 10 years some of them and they speak almost no ukrainian <laughs> and i mean you you get by you, you use a lot of hand signals and it kind of annoys me that there's a lot of like sex tourists in ukraine yes yeah and they just show up and they're living here like 10 years and they can't even speak like two words of ukrainian yeah yeah to to be honest with you um before the war I generally did not associate with uh, uh, any any Americans or any any foreigners here actually, um, because they all had that creepy vibe to me. Basically, they all had that like red red. I'm extreme red pill, and I'm gonna like yeah, you know Gonzalo Lira type thing, and it just eh. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of creeps for sure. Yeah. Well, I think um, now, like my friends who are in the Legion, <laughs> I think they all thought that they were going to come here to Ukraine and instantly just have women falling all over them. And uh, they have generally been very disappointed, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, especially, uh, and I, I don't know why that is exactly. Um, maybe you, you have an idea about this, Matt, but... Um, soldiers in Ukraine do not have it's not as sexy like it is I would say in America you know ooh a man in uniform it's yeah it, like half the people here in uniform yeah yeah um <laughs> cipher says it's a good thing it, it shows Ukrainian women have standards <laughs> yeah um, yeah, it makes a big difference if you just try to speak a little Ukrainian. You know, it really, really helps. It's the you know? same thing everywhere else in the world. People appreciate you making an effort. Exactly. Exactly. It's really true. And they, they love it, actually, when you try to... What I think is funny, what I get from people a lot of times, because I'm trying to work on my Ukrainian and my Ukrainian pronunciation, um, and... They they'll say things like, "Wow, your Ukraine your Ukrainian is better than mine," especially older people because maybe they only spoke uh, Russian and um, they're trying to learn Ukrainian themselves. You know. Yeah, um, my ex girlfriend was like a hardcore patriot, like Ukraine everything, mm -hmm. hates all Russians, any any amount of speaking Russian. So besides uh, uh, having your finances straight, learning a little bit of Ukrainian, you know, um, what other things can you think of that, that a person would need? Let's, I mean, do you think it's absolutely necessary that they connect with some group before they come to Ukraine? Whether that's That would be league? ideal. So you have an idea of what you're doing when you touch down. Mm -hmm. 
you don't want to just stick around in like an Airbnb for weeks, burning through your money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although it is super cheap to to get housing here. Yeah, yeah, that's a thing. Super, super cheap. You know. Um, yeah. But you can spend money, and it it'll just go away. You know. Um, I I came here and uh, within a month got a job teaching English. So I came here with I, I had a couple thousand, you know, to to hold me over. Um, but th- this is before the war, of course. And um, I've I've found that um, you know if you're if you can do nothing else if you come here if some if somebody this is what really drove me crazy. Um, at, the, at the beginning of the wars, a lot of people would message me, and some people told me they were actually in Ukraine, you know. And I was like, "Great. Uh, well, if you're not doing anything, I can I can hook you up with some schools to teach to teach at. You know, teaching English is is a really good skill here, I would say. And you don't have to." You don't have to have any teaching experience. They just want to talk to a native speaker. Actually, you don't get paid very much. You only um, you only uh, uh, how do I say this? You only get paid about maybe ten bucks an hour <laughs> to teach yeah. here. You know, but that's a hell of a lot better than what most people get paid in Ukraine. Like getting ten dollars yeah. an hour. That's amazing. That's like. Uh, a high level programmer gets ten dollars an hour. Yeah. You know. Uh okay, Conti. Uh I was an English practice partner for Ukrainians for 18 months before coming. Oh, interesting. Most of my support here was through students. Yeah. And I mean, you'll get you could get if you came to Ukraine and did that, you could actually um get paid on you know, get paid enough to live and stay here and then you know, so if you showed up to Ukraine with a couple thousand and you just didn't know what you were going to do, you end up teaching English. Hey, at least you're doing something, you know. Yeah. Uh, Dimitri's right, too, though. He said, like, if you have a real skill to bring with you, that's going to separate you from the pack. Yeah. Because there's a lot of volunteers or people who want to volunteer that don't really know what they want to do or don't have right. any, like, in-demand skills. But the more you have of that, the higher chance you're going to get plugged in with a group that can utilize your talents. Yeah, that's true.